first, uh, thank you. Um, it's a. It's actually been a long time since I've been in Ottawa, and it's really good to be back. I saw my first computer at the National Research Council here. I did my first uh, piece of music on a computer for the NRC. I, uh, Dave Thompson, Dave Thomas, who started Object Technologies, was one of my really early supporters. My group when I was at U of T. Alistair Hamilton, who's a graduate from the Industrial Design Program here, was probably the strongest, one of the strongest influences, at least in my sketching book. So there's a there's a group of connections, and there's a whole other part of the work. So it, even though I never went to Carleton, there's an and and lived here, it was there's a strong connection, and it's uh, it's just good to be back. So I'm gonna uh, go. I'm trying to cover a lot of material. Um, if you want along the way, I, I don't mind being interrupted. And um, I'll try and make this as conversational as we can in this group. So I'm going to just jump right into it. And I, and, and the real thing is, I want to talk at the larger level. I'm going to talk about design. A lot of my examples are from industrial design. But I'd rather um, I want to point out that it doesn't matter whether you're designing an organization, a culture, or um, maybe even you know your financial planning. The, <laughs> some of these things are cut across. It just happens that my examples are coming from a specific domain. I'm going to go through three case studies if I can make it and um, we'll see how it goes. But the main thing is I want to dispel the myths that are being foisted by too much pressure from press, peer pressure, and financial pressure and other forces to push people who are in the design profession, especially those early in their career, on down a path that I don't think is productive. And the first one is this cult of the hero worship and that you want to be the first, you want to be the best, and you want to be that designer in black that's uh, you know, um, not at all what they pretend to be and, and so on. And, and I'm going to pick on Edison because he was the first, uh, he was the Steve Jobs of his time. He was the first uh, person to have a press agent who would shape his public persona. His lawyer wrote his hagiography and, and we'll see what and we'll go on about see how this happens. So Edison was a brilliant man. There's no question about that. And he did a lot of things. And um, he, uh, first of all, he established what is arguably the first corporate research lab. And I, you know, that's great. That's, a, that's what we need. I think it would be great if industry had more research labs so that all those PhDs who are brilliant don't have to be underemployed uh, technicians because academia can't absorb them and there should be room for research. Um, he has a large number of patents, um, um, both U.S. and internationally, and he is the sole inventor on all of those patents. So either he is superhuman or um, it's not true, and, um, and it's not true. Uh, it's true that um, he has those patents. It's true he's listed as the sole inventor. If anybody believes that, uh, you really have to stay for the whole talk. Um, and the but the, this is the part, is that the myth is the myth of the individual genius inventor, uh, the person who does something on their own. And, and the problem is, is if you believe that as a, as a practitioner, you're striving for something even the people you're using as the role models couldn't do. Because that's the press, that's the public persona. Understand that's marketing, that's Frank Gehry doesn't design all Frank Gehry buildings. And he's very open about that. Um, and but some people aren't, and it's really important to understand that. So I want to do some fact checking just quickly, and uh, we'll take one of his most important patents here, which is uh, for the incandescent light bulb. This is the fundamental patent, and and if we go through this, we'll see that um, it basically was a, a, cop, a carbon wire um, or, or, or sheets, and they're arranged to offer great resistance. And you put them in a vacuum, and you pass current through, and they're going to uh, and voila, you have the incandescent light bulb. And so apparently he invented the incandescent light bulb. And certainly he, if you look at the, if you can see the fonts, it's hard in the image, but he is the sole inventor on, on this patent. But of course, that's not true. Um, that, that the breakthrough that resulted in this patent happened about a month before. It was October 22nd, 22nd in 1879. But the two people who mainly did it that was a, a, a fellow who was a scientist, a mathematician on the crew, uh, uh, the, the only person with a you know, high level of scientific training in the lab 
was uh, Upton and uh, a, a, somebody who was really good on the mechanics and, and, and technical side, um, uh, Charles uh, Batchelor. There were other people involved in it, but at that point, Edison was working on other things as well, and he was not um, directly there. He was supervising, sure, but he wasn't doing it. But the patent filed on the 4th of, of November that same year, um, Edison's the sole inventor. And I'm sorry, that's just not the case. And today, actually, that wouldn't be allowed. But, but that's, that's the type of thing that, that sort of says, well, first of all, he didn't do it alone. He had a team. And if you ever think about it, he actually built up a very large team. And if he invented everything by himself, what were the thousand or whatever number of people doing that were in, working in the labs? It's like the director of Microsoft Research claiming that he invented everything or she um, invented everything in the, in, in, in the lab. And so you, you have to just, you know, you have to just, we have to think more critically about this if, in fact, we want to have role models make sure that we, we understand what's theater and what's real. And so even in the incandescent light bulb, if you go back and do the history, you'll see that there's a lot of prior art. Um, there's a guy named, in the UK named Joseph Swan in December 1878. He demonstrated, yes, a carbon filament inside of a, a vacuum with high resistance emitting light. Now, it burned out really quickly, but the basic concepts were already there. And in fact, um, it was so close to Edison's work that Edison actually went and, and he was very good in mergers and acquisition to be able to shield himself. So he either acquired people who were going to fight him on patents or, or, or made partnerships. And, and that's what happened here to avoid the conflicts of, of, in terms of intellectual property. But there's a book um, about Edison that uh, by Friedel and Israel that, that um, they, I, gotta remember, I can't remember the number, but they list 22 inventions prior to the, the November patent. That, that, that dealt with the, the same basic concepts. And all I'm saying is none of, and literally none of this grows out of a vacuum, um, uh, except the light bulb itself. And there was, um, it's really interesting because it, it isn't that, this is a, we're in the neighborhood of when uh, Darwin was writing The Origins of the Species and introducing these notions of evolution. And it's really Fascinating how quickly the term evolution was used to describe the nature of technological um, development uh, as, as well as biological. So they transferred these conceptual models from biology into uh, technology. That in itself is an example of um, standing on the shoulders of giants. You take from here to there because you see a similar pattern. So you can take knowledge from here and apply it there so you can advance the art. And that's kind of what this whole talk is about. Uh, but Karl Marx even wrote about this, and this, this quote is pretty cool, because in Das Kapital, he, he um, uh, um, really did uh, speak about this notion that there was no tools, even if you go way back in history, in, in economic history, he was an economist and, and the, that were invented by a single individual. They, there was this pro progress. And so the, there is, and I'll do this quickly, but we've, um, rather than this notion of the individual inventor, um, there was, this is um, from John of Salisbury in the, was 1120 and, uh, to 1180. He, he, he talks about this notion of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, that every, every, as you move along, um, that each in innovation is, is, is the result of finding somebody else and then choosing to stand on the shoulders. And one of the things I think I said in the conversation earlier this morning is the thing that rather than being the genius inventor, the person in black, the sole person, um, the, the, the attainable aspiration is to, first of all, um, become really discriminating in terms of whose shoulders you choose to stand on and what's appropriate in order to achieve the goals that you want, and, and, and measure your success on whether at the end of that you're worthy for somebody to stand on your shoulders. And you cannot expect anything more than that in, in a realistic sense. Beyond that, it, it starts to move into hubris. And, and, but what's happening, I see in the field today, in terms of where the encouragements are, is that the inventor part, and let's just make something new, I'm going to be the one who did this. And there's, you know, the whole media lab at MIT, in a way, um, especially in the early days, had that, that, that sort of um, ethos of uh, we have to do something really different so we can be distinguished, so, so we can bring in money. And there's a, that economic thing to basically market things as if they're brand new, uh, even if it's just by relabeling or, or re um, changing the, the styling, but, 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 but 
hopefully everybody who's doing that understands that where the work really came from and in their academic papers as opposed to their fundraising papers acknowledge the sources. But what, what's, but what it's not to say even there isn't room for creativity in individuals making serious contributions. It's just a question of finding the balance. And right now it's skewed in, the, in a direction that's not, uh, I don't think is, is, is productive. And I think we need to embody that in our whole way we teach and how we hire, how we manage our groups. And I like, since Canada is supposed to be a world leader in mining, I'll use a mining example. Um, many of us, um, uh, you know, we're Canadian, you're up here in the Canadian Shield, so um, paddling around here, a lot of us carried canoes and portages when we're freezing cold or getting eaten by mosquitoes and going over the Canadian Shield. And, and, and the point is, is that we can do that blindly because we don't have the, we might be great paddlers, but we're not geologists. So we may be walking over a gold mine or a, or whatever um, diamond mine, uh, actually in, the, in more recent years. But the point is, is that uh, we know that you can't make gold and, and, and you can't invent anything. And so I want to compare, um, the Edison is by analogy a bit like alchemy. You're trying to make gold out of a bunch of other things. And, try, and, and the, by the way, there was a lot of interesting, um, I don't know if science is the right word, but that came out of alchemy just in terms of understanding things about chemistry and, and, and materials. But, but nobody made gold because you couldn't. And I think that um, the same thing's true. So if we, what, what, what is the process of, of if, we're pro, if we're trying to get something of deep value, and let's use gold as the analogy, well, the first thing you have to know how to prospect. So where do you look? And that's the same thing I said before about whose shoulders you're going to stand on or why. What, the, what even what is a good problem that you want that's worthy of your time? You know, you spend all this, you know, 13 years in university to get your PhD or whatever, and then why would you waste that on, a, a, on an unworthy problem? And, and, and so it, that's, that's the whole part of prospecting. And, and, but that's not enough. Um, even if you've got a really great um, grub stake, um, unless you know how to mine it and extract the materials, um, then you're still, um, you've still just got an idea, which is fine, and somebody else can do it. But if you want to live with your, see your children, how your, your, the, your birth, you give birth to this idea, if you want to see it through, you've got to figure out how, the, this other part of, of how do you mine it, and then how do you refine it? And, 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 the, and the beautiful part, and this is where design's involved in all of these, but the part is, is what happens when you can actually go beyond the gold and, and like a goldsmith and turn it into jewelry so it's worth more than its weight in gold. In some sense, you know, this analogy can break down really easily, I get it, but realize how many different professions have to be involved in making each of those stages and what's different, how the skill sets in each phase have to change. But there's a process, and, and if you can manage the whole process, you can have a, you can, have a, a really valuable enterprise, whether it's an academic enterprise or, or a commercial enterprise. And, but the main thing is, is that, first of all, you have to actually be realistic about what the process are, and processes are and where the, what the various stages are. And, and I'll forget to the thing. But if we want to take a very different approach, we can just go to art. And my, I love uh, Marcel Duchamp and his uh, ready-mades because um, he went mining for... <laughs> You know, he's creating art, and Picasso did the same thing with his collage and Kurt Schwitters. They just took found materials and created stuff out of it. And the neat thing was is that they saw value in almost everything. That's, that's the aesthetic. That's the way they approached, and their discipline was, was fine art and trying to provoke society and so on and so forth. But if you go up to one level, the process is, is the same. It, it's a question of mining the resources of things that are hidden in plain sight that most people don't see, but you see them or you see some relationships and you make something by combining them into something different or something more than they were. And, and that's, that's a, a, a core part of the creativity. My definition of the act of creativity is creativity is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. You see the relations first. And the best kind and gets the best traction is that when people, you say it, people say it, they say, oh, Wow, and they get it instantly. That surprising obviousness, and then all of a sudden they say, "Well, that's obvious." I could have thought of that, and uh, oh, actually, I did think of that. I just didn't see it as that. Right? Get paid before you get to that stage. But the but the but the main point is is that um, sometimes that that's what it is. It's it's teasing out relationships, um, and that's how you prospect. Uh, you see different features in the geology, and you start to to try and mine them. So having said all of that, I, I, I'm going to use a metaphor that uh, practices what I preach. I saw this uh, article, first of all, um, 
and wired by, by um, Anderson, by Chris Anderson of the long tail. And many of you have seen that. And I literally just stole his uh, graphic and flipped it around because you know, so Jose Imanes, uh in the first line of uh, Fahrenheit 451 said, if they give you ruled paper, write the other way. So um, I also make really bad puns. I'm always playing with things and twist them around upside down and so on forth. And I do that with ideas and what I see. And I just saw that long tail. I said, well, there's got to be a long nose. And it's either Pinocchio, which is a lie, or it's Cyrano de Bergerac, which is uh, a lover. But it's this is a, a thing I love. So it, it, it came out it came out okay. And I go to the, the long nose. And this is the long nose of innovation. And, and this grew out of actually when I looked at some reports from the National Academy of Science. And there's actually been a few of these. There's actually four. You can download them off the, the, the site. They're, these are called tire track diagrams. But they trace the evolution of uh, all the core technologies that have been happening over the last, in, in, say, in information technologies, telecommunications, it works in biotech, um, and the relationships with academic research, how it passes over to uh, industrial research, to industry practice, and how different subcategories then start to merge and come together and do things. And they're called tire track diagrams because the graphs moving across these horizontal lines look like the track left in snow with your snow tires, which you are going to encounter in the next few weeks, probably. But the main thing about the long nose is, is this, is that if you look at the data that, um, that, that basically from the first inception, time is running left to right, at the first inception of an idea to the time it's mature, and let's say we measure maturity as it's a billion dollar industry, it takes at least 20 years on average. And, that's, and, and so this is really important to say because everybody's talking about how fast technology is moving. It's not moving fast, it's moving at a snail's pace. And if you know the difference between voltage and amperage, it's like that. Um, it's what we mistake as technology moving quickly is a bunch of things moving slowly. And, and so I'll give you a couple of examples, but the mouse, which I first encountered just down the road at the National Research Council in 1971, they had a mouse. It was wooden, it was carved out of wood with just some potentiometers, handmade. And uh, it was, they had it since 1969 because they saw uh, Ken Pulfer and Grant Bechtold from NRC went to this demo from, um, the mother of all demos that Doug Engelbart did in, in 1968, where he publicly did this demo that just still rocked the world. Just, just Bing or Google the mother of all demos and watch that, and be, you'll be blown away. But um, the mouse was actually first done in 1965. It was really, everybody knew about it by, by 68 in the industry, uh, including Bill Gates, and including Steve Jobs, everybody knew about it, including the NRC. They were open about it. They showed uh, Grant Bechtold how to make the mouse. That's the mouse I, I have in my collection. That's the one I saw in 71. Um, it, uh, Xerox Park uh, had a mouse in, in, in 73. They, they, they started to do it. They, they patented it something that had already been done in 68 in Germany, but they didn't know it in, 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 in 60. Uh, Sorry, in, in, in 78, um, the star, Xerox star came out in 83, and the Mac came out in 84, and that's when everybody knew about a mouse, but they only had 6% market share. So it wasn't until 1965 that basically every computer had a mouse, even though everybody knew from 1968 that that was necessary, that it was going to be the next thing. It was, it was going to happen. Because it wasn't about the mouse, it's about the entire ecosystem. It was the promise that the mouse provoked, but which to realize that promise required a whole ecosystem, a whole perfect storm of networks, of bitmap displays, of display processors, of the skills to develop the graphic user interface, of icons and windows and all that stuff all had to happen before the mouse could reach its, its potential. 30 years, 1965 to 1995, when Windows 95 came out. There was Windows earlier versions, but they, they, wasn't, it just didn't, they didn't have the value. 85, 95 is when the, the, everybody had a mouse. That's 30 years for something that's obvious, and it's just this little dinky thing. But the thing is, is that even though that nose is there, anybody who chooses, like one of those little gooseneck things that bob over water, you can dip your head below the radar, and all of that's visible if you know where to look. You, if you know how to prospect, that whole 20 years of history is there. Now, what that says to me, and this is what you say to every one of you, um, if you believe nothing's new, it's already there, 
and it's about prospecting, at least the core, or the things out of which you want to construct your relationship, um, you just have to know where to look and how to look. That's, what, that's, that's where your creativity comes in the process, not so much in the, in the answers. That they, The answers are easy once you have the right process and the right team. But the key thing is, is that if you come to me or anybody responsible and say, I have this incredible idea, you know, it's going to be huge in the next five years if we just do it now, and it's great, and I'm going to say, wow, that's really fascinating. Give me 15 years of history of that idea. And if you can't, I'm going to say, you haven't done your homework. You might be right, but as far as I can see, it's either lucky guess or you, you just, you're wrong. But you're asking me to gamble, not to invest, and I'm not going to take my RSP and stick it in a slot machine or buy a lottery ticket because that's not a good investment. Come back when you can give me 15 years of history of your idea or um, see you later. But come back. I'm happy to hear it. I'm intrigued, but I don't believe you because you haven't done your homework. And, and, and that's, it, it, it's really interesting if you start to take that and, 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 and put that in position on yourself as well as on the people who work with you and that and, 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 and push each other. So that's how we raise the bar as a community. So if we come back uh, to say that in 1984, um, I learned about capacitive touch from a guy um, uh, here at, at the National Research Council, who, Hugh LeCain, who was building these musical instruments with single finger touch uh, sensors, and they were fantastic. Um, I started to build, I wanted to make a drum for two hands, and so I, I, we had a group and we built some capacitive multi-touch. It's 1984, we published that. Um, that's the first paper on capacitive multi-touch. You notice I said it's the first paper that I know of in on multi-touch. But as soon as I published it, I got called by a friend of mine, like Grant Beck, no, um, Lloyd Nakatani from Bell Labs, and said, I think you should come and visit us. And this guy named Bob Boys, who had something that was so much better. It was a full-on touch screen on a, on, and, and with multi-touch and capacitive, everything that was on the uh, iPad, iPhone and, and on the iPad. Uh, he'd done it. He did it way better than we'd done it. Um, but most people didn't know about it. Again, it was below the radar. And we're never first. We might have been the first to, to publish it and make it more public, but, but that's, but actually, I love it that, that we weren't because it supports my belief system. And, and I also know that that all came from this stuff. And even back in the 30s, uh, there were people making funny electronic instruments in Germany with, uh, with, with capacitive touch. And by the way, the first capacitive touchscreen that was used commercially was in 1965. And it was used in air traffic control um, just uh, in, in the UK, in the southern UK airspace. But, but it took until to become along, it took to 2007 that this whole brand new thing came out of capacitive multi-touch on the iPhone. But there is a direct path from our work in Toronto to the University of Delaware to a company that came out of that that got bought by Apple and went there. And if you want to read that history, it's a really nice decomposition of the iPhone, including the Gorilla Glass and the uh, lithium ion batteries and, and the ARM processor. It's a book called um, The One Device, and it's by a guy named Brian Merchant. And it's a really nice way to actually say, what are all the pieces that have to come together? And the other thing is the App Store, that, uh, which is actually one of the major things. The, the iPhone, like nearly all of the Apple products, was a failure for the first year or two. And, and so let's um, just say, um, Give me an example. I have to give you an example that, 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 that I'm not just blowing smoke. And so when I was a kid, that's what roller skates were like. Um, you strap them onto your shoes, and they're like bob skates if you uh, ice skated, if any of you had those when you were a kid. But, but that's, those, were, those were skates. So, and after that, you had these kind of roller skates. These are what you sort of find in the happy days kind of uh, period in the 50s and 60s, and people going along Venice Beach and, and dancing on their skates and so on and so forth. And then the, and then the progress comes up to the, these more fancy modern uh, inline skates, which is a, a, an improvement. So this is sort of the combination of ice skates. See, it's an existing idea. Ice skates already existed. But you get the inline, like an, a skate blade. And those look like hockey. The boot looks like a hockey skate. And the, and the down are, are the four wheels put in a row. So you can actually, um, it's, it's a very different sport. And, and so great innovation, great invention, right? Well, I'm sorry, but um, 17, oh, sorry, 1879, is that right? Yes, no, 1819, patent on inline skates, right? There's nothing new. Now, here's the part that's really fascinating. This is why it takes a really long time. 
So first of all, this is what I love about these. What the hell were they skating on? Right? You didn't have uh, you know these beautiful like uh, floors or, or hard flights or sidewalks, right? They're cobblestones or dirt, or, you know, or grass. I mean, it's just like I, I just. Um, and how do they stay on? But they're like they've got the boots of bobskates, and and, uh, and but you, but you realize they it doesn't matter how good that idea is. Even if they had the modern the most modern inline skates, then you still don't have the thing to skate on, and you and everything is requires an ecosystem. That's what it keeps talking about this, this perfect storm, and that's why things move so slowly, is because it's not a. a a technology isn't a product, and a product isn't a business, and and a, a business doesn't make an ecosystem. And you need this whole ecosystem of from the education, the hardware, the software, and all these other things for things to actually break through. And that takes time. So let's um, do a couple of case studies. So um, no, I'm not going to give a sexist talk. I'm just give you a thing about history. Um, so this is how to appeal to women. Um, and I'm not talking about, uh, so here's a, a camera. <laughs> okay, this camera was, uh, get this right, is, is, is 1926. It was a, it's, a, it's the vest pocket camera, the Kodak vest pocket camera. Now, first of all, women don't wear vests and to fit that, so it was targeted. It's clear the demographic, it's black, it's a camera, it's technology. Um, it was targeted to men. And so they were selling really well. By the way, it's really interesting. These cameras also had a stylus that's tucked in the front there and a slot in the back. So when you took the picture, you could actually annotate the picture on the camera. And when you printed it, the annotation would come out with it. And you can't do that on your phone today because your phone doesn't have a stylus in the first place. But, but the notion of being able to annotate images in the phone and send them immediately to somebody else without changing apps, you can't do it. There's an idea, right? Old, you can still do it, and we can't do it today, but we can do it then. On, on thing, so so they wanted to appeal to women to to expand the market. So they hired Walter Darwin Teague, who is arguably one of the how you can't be one of the first three, if not the first five, industrial designers in North America. And and it's an interesting thing too because the all of them started around 1927 to 1929. Industrial design was an invented term. There was no schools, no training. There's a brand new profession. And they're starting in private practice, not in, except with one exception, Harley Earl, who was with General Motors. They all were in private practice. And by the way, they were all in practice in 1940s, which means they all stayed in business as a private practice in a profession that didn't exist prior to that throughout the entire Great Depression. And by the way, the companies that survived the Great Depression were the ones that employed them. So if anybody tells you design is just a lolly, a, 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 a gratuitous lollipop that will, um, that that's not you can only afford it when you've got some surplus. It's nonsense. No, in the depression they all survived. Raymond Loy, Henry Dreyfus, um, the Teague. Uh, the only one who didn't was was Bel Geddes, but he was just a, a dreamer and, and he was an artist more than a designer in a sense. He, yeah, but he was influential nevertheless. But so what did what did what did Teague do? And this was his first contract. This was his first major. But because of this, this is how he got, he, he, to the end of his life, he always was a lead designer for Kodak. He took exactly the same camera and changed the color. And then he packaged it in this leather-covered case where the leather matches the color of the camera that's lined with silk and a complementary color. And then he packaged that in this beautiful um, box that's sort of like the type of ink that you find in the inside of bindings of, of beautiful books to give a classy thing. And um, he rebranded it to call it the vanity camera instead of the uh, vest pocket uh, camera. But he didn't even take the label off of the, it's the still thing. That, 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 that thing, see, the Vest Pocket Kodak Series 3. He didn't change it. It's exactly the same thing. This is just styling right through and through. And, and, I, and then he released it not in one color, but in five different colors simultaneously. 
And oh, he did one other thing, he doubled the price. And it sold like hotcakes. And so um, he got the demographic. The women bought these cameras. And so then we move ahead and we come into 2003. Apple had a product, a problem. They had a product, it was white instead of black, but it was, the market was skewed to men, to males. Women weren't buying it. It was called the iPod. So Johnny Ive, what are you gonna do about it? You had this cool product that's neat, but we're not getting, we're not addressing the, the full market. How are we gonna do that? Well, one way to invent something, or the way practice was, who else has had this problem? And because Johnny Ive is an, an, a well-educated industrial designer, he said he knew Teague's work. Teague did the same thing. And so Johnny just said, okay, let's re, uh, you know, to do a remix. And so um, if we come down there, um, he just said, I'm going to just change the color. He did one other thing that Teague didn't do. I'm going to make it smaller. But other than smaller and in color and rebranding it, it's the same thing. And the other part here that's really cool is that um, he released it in, in more than one color. And guess what? He released it in five colors. Oh, and guess what? They're the same five colors. And there they are lined up. I own all of them. So the colors are sort of dark and, and they're, they're a little bit faded in the cameras, but, and the, so the saturation is not the same, but the hue is. And, and that's, that's not a coincidence. And, and again, I mentioned something like this before. So record, being, just when you're out there, if you're studying and reading the literature and looking at products and you're just mining the, what's already out there all the time for just ideas, you're gonna, every, every once in a while you come to a problem and say, oh, I can see a connection. That's one of those, it's the same thing. I never saw that relationship before. That's how to solve this problem. Now I've got, I just have to figure out, okay, what, what, what's the form factor I'm gonna use to get the shape of the, 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 the iPods and so on and so forth. But the strategy and everything was not new. He's standing on Teague's shoulders. And, and that, by the way, makes me respect him all the more, not less. He's riffing off, not ripping off. And, and, and the story is even cooler than this because it's rampant. So um, this is from 1999. This, this is the, the um, iJam, uh, iJ100 uh, play. By the way, if anybody, anybody finds a yellow one of those, I have, it's the only color I don't have. I will fly you to Toronto or I'll fly to Ottawa and take you out to dinner or whatever the bribe is. To, I just, I've been looking for about five years and I can't find one. Um, but I want the full set so I can actually set them up and, and, and exhibit. But anyhow, these were pretty cool um, because they, remember I said that Teague didn't shrink the cameras, but the colors? Well, guess what? Um, these were way smaller. Uh, and, 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 the, and so the smallness, because these preceded the, the, that, the iPod, the, the, the colored iPods. And, and so, and they also had a radio in them. So this is the, uh, you can see the size here, and, and you can see there they are at, at scale. These are, that's, the, these are the correct proportions to, to each other here. But the, but, so that's pretty neat. But it gets even more incestuous in, a, in the positive sense of that, if that's possible. That if we take that over, look at that thing's translucent. It's got that translucent plastic. Well, guess what? The Apple Mac is the iconic image that drove that tendency. And by the way, the iMac was data, is, is, it came before, the year before. And so on the one hand, Apple's taking stuff from a pre, for their MP3 player, the small one, from the, the iJam, but the iJam's taking the translucent plastic from Apple. Right? That's, it's, just, it's just really cool. And, and when you start to see those patterns, oh, and by the way, the, that, the iMac wasn't the first product that Johnny Ive designed that had the translucent pra practice. That thing on the left is actually the last version of the Newton. They finally couldn't sell it. They were trying to figure out how they can make money with the Newton. So they put the Newton inside of a clamshell with a keyboard and so on. So it actually looked like a, but it was still just a Newton, which was their PDA. 
but it was that translucent plastic. So even that had roots, and, and we're building them. So you're allowed to even riff off your own work, right? That's called evolving. And, and, but it's really, really neat. When you start to look at the world that way and start, and it's full of these types of examples, but you have to dive in and not halfway. You gotta get fully wet to actually start to see this. But the more you see, the, the more you have a repertoire of these types of examples in your back pocket, then when your problem comes up, you can just pull up with a solution. And, and then you can do what I said you have to be able to do. When somebody says, I, why do you think you're right? I say, because Walter Doran Teague did it. Right? There's your 15 years. You met my criterion. Okay, I'll invest. Because I know who Teague is. He's got a great reputation. I know the history of Kodak. I never would have thought of that. Great idea. Because it's not your idea, but it's a refinement of that idea, you get a bonus rather than a reduction in your fee. And so let's try another one. We can sort of work. This is a tale of two Sonys. It's the same kind of thing. So this is the, the Sony cassette recorder. So this thing was 1978. It was, this is a Microsoft kind of product. It was for the enterprise. And it was for business people. So that it was the first uh, I cassette. Uh, cassettes were this type of, this size and format of cassette was, were, were new. And, and so you could dictate and, and take notes. It was monophonic, but it had a speaker, but also a headphone jack, a little uh, earbud. And, um, and it was mono, and, and you could take it anywhere you wanted and, and do things. And it was a pretty cool product. It's built like a, a tank. Uh, robust, and it was a commercial failure. Um, so if we just bang through all those, um, what do they do? So this is the back side of it, where you can see the speaker. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they took out the speaker. That's pretty weird. They took out the record. And sort of like, like excuse me, what is it you don't get about tape recorder, right? And sound and no speaker, that's, that's crazy. Although there is a French aviator whose name escapes me at the moment, but who made the statement that the design isn't finished when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing more to remove. They were removing stuff to improve the product. And, um, and here's what came out, the Walkman. And there was huge debate in Sony. How could you possibly do this? And so they designed these uh, lightweight headsets. And there was a playback-only device. And they actually <laughs> they, they kept the microphone and the record button, but it didn't record. It turned the microphone on and fed the audio through the headset. Now, the claimed reason was so that when you have the headphones on, that you could still, uh, it was like pass-through that you have on today's headphones, so you could actually hear the sound outside, and then if you, come, if you take it off, the, these are going to block the sound you can't hear. But of course, those earbuds don't block anything. And it was just the, it would have cost money to take the, to change the, the machinery of the, they could use the same parts from the second one from the first. They could recycle the, the tooling and stuff like that. So the industrial designers asked them about what tooling is. If you, but it, it just made, it, you could get it to market faster. And, and so, it, it was it it was it was really really something, but but it took an existing enterprise product and made it into a, 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 an entertainment product. They basically the first tape recorder was a Microsoft product, so to speak, and this was an Apple product in terms of the old version of Microsoft and, and the older version. Microsoft moved into the entertainment space, Xbox, blah blah blah, and. Just as Apple's gone into the enterprise, but but in the stereotypical view, um, that's there, and they they took things out that you would assume would always be there, and but the most remarkable thing were the social, cultural, political tools of the people who actually managed to get that decision through the opposition and the very powerful opposition within Sony, the saying that is not what we do. Well, how could you do that? And it doesn't matter how good the technology is. Nobody knew how big the, the Walkman would be and how influential. And by the way, Steve Jobs did not know how big or influential the, I, um, the iMac, the iPod, and the iPhone would be. He dreamed about it. But his business model was such that he could meet his business plan 
with a fraction of that. But with Johnny Ive, and this is where the industrial comes into industrial design, they had it so like in Spinal Tap, they could turn the production line and the supply chain up to 11. If it, by some stroke of luck, it just took off. Something that the Nintendo Wii did not do and left a billion plus dollars on the table because they couldn't meet demand. Apple did not make that mistake. And that was a really important part. You design for this, which is attainable and believable, but you basically also designed that if it actually is successful, you can crank it up quickly. And if it's not successful, you can wind it down without incurring huge, huge uh, in, in investments. And this is all part of the, you have to understand these things if you're gonna make this stuff work. But the backstory is really how this happened is that there was a, the engineer who, who did this, did it at the request of the co-founder of Sony who was flying around on business. He was the, the person who went out and did all this, the marketing and, and, and sales stuff. And he loved opera and he wanted, he was on the plane so much, he wanted to listen to music on the plane to listen to opera. And so they, they just hacked the existing thing, built a prototype out of the existing hardware, put in a stereo heads, took out the speakers, built the earphones, and, 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 and put music. And, and, and so that the executive is the one who commissioned this prototype, was a market research of one, but had the power of a million, because <laughs> he's the co-founder, and helped carry that through. Now the lesson here is that if you can find a champion, don't come and try to sell to your own company. You have to have whoever is a gatekeeper, the most senior gatekeeper you can, not to be somebody who is your customer to take, get permission. No, you want it to be their project. So this is the important thing. If you want something done, just be happy, make it be somebody else's idea. The biggest skill is let somebody else think it's their idea. Set them up so your, what you thought of it, it, they, they believe it's theirs. And never say, that was actually my idea. You have to let them have the credit because you have the satisfaction. You actually got it to market. And you have to be able to do those things. And that's why you, you don't want to be the genius inventor that, that, that invented anything because you're going to take the blame when it doesn't work too. And it's more likely not to work because you, you took that attitude. But the other part um, I, we can do is come back to Edison and do a comparison now with Edison compared compare to the behavior of Sony and, and see what happens. Because this is just a little timeline about the history of, uh, of the record player as we, as we go through. And, 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 and by the way, um, Edison didn't invent the record player out of the blue uh, any more than um, he invented the light bulb. There's prehistory. But I'm going to grant, pretend, I'm going to start where he, for, for where he comes. But the main thing was is that there was uh, Victor, which became RCA Victor, but then Victorola. Um, it, it didn't matter that Edison was it, he perceived as being the first, is that other companies just came in and, and just kept innovating and, and cannibalizing their stuff and going like that. But, but Edison was determined that he was right and would not broker any change. And therefore, the competition just went white past him because he, he had that much faith in his own belief to his own detriment. And the same thing happened, by the way, in terms of power, which is why he actually was not a financial success. He kept having to go back and get money all the time. Um, that, that Victor uh, came ahead. There's this whole thing that you, you, you have to be willing to eat your own children, so to speak, uh, in terms of your products, not your real children, obviously. But the, uh, but the point here is that Edison clearly didn't have that flexibility. And that's as great a strength that he was determined, but that's also a weakness. And the question is, when you have powerful people with great ideas, they have to be willing to listen or be persuaded. The iPhone was a failure for at least a year. And you'll read this in the Brian Merchant book if you want the full story. Because Steve Jobs firmly believed that the killer app on the iPhone was the phone. It's about the phone, stupid. And they were losing money like crazy until finally they convinced them that you, if you let outside developers build applications for the iPhone, it will take off. And there was a latent thing for there. And, and that's what happened. And, the, and we'll talk about that. But the main thing is here, Edison lost because he wasn't agile. And he wasn't adapting. And he thought that the record player had to record. It needed a microphone. 
Sony had the microphone too, and they said, we don't need the microphone, we're gonna strip it down. And, and, and it's that issue, it doesn't need to record as well as playback. So the lesson here is, um, even if you invented something, even if you were a genius inventor, that doesn't mean you're the one who reaps the benefits. Because there's a whole long part of this ecosystem that has to be followed through to do the whole deal. And so, you know, people who say, I invented this because here's a rendering of, of, a, of the product and the concept. It's like, give me a break. It's just, um, you, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's really important to understand that. Don't, no idea is precious. Ideas are a dime a dozen. And if you can't have, uh, you know, if, if I can't do 10 patentable ideas a day, I probably shouldn't have my job. If I patent all 10 of them, I shouldn't have my job. Because it means I have no discrimination of what's important and, and what, it, what it costs and what it takes. The clear thing is, is that you have all these ideas and that. The, the creative part is knowing which ones to execute on and how and follow through. And so concepts are a dime a dozen. And that's why you, you, sh it, you should be free to share them because you'll always get something back. And that might be the trigger that really makes them valuable. So let's just work on the, the third case study. We'll work through this quickly. This is the iPod Classic. Design. So I'm going to stick with Apple. I'm going to, I like these Apple designs because I'm not, I don't work for Apple. And therefore, I can't be accused of, uh, of, of, of promoting my own work, having that bias. But the other reason is, it's, a, it's kind of like an ethical reason, is because I actually have a huge amount of respect for, for Apple design and for, uh, for Johnny Ive. And, that, and, and I'm not going to, he's my competitor, but he just raises the game and makes me perform better. That, that the, the, the better Apple does, and, and Nintendo or whatever these companies do, uh, the more I should study them and, 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 and not copy them. Because you never win by doing the same and training the same way as everybody else. You actually develop a new way. If you know about the Fosbury flop he, and the high jump in the Mexico Olympics, he, you had to jump with your hips going across the high jump first. And he just came in and, and did that, did a, the, did a roll and could jump way higher than everybody else. He wasn't a better athlete. He just uh, didn't train and copy and, and jump the same way, but he followed the rules. Um, you got to do that all the time. So here's, here's four devices which are really, really cool. I, by the way, all of these things are in my collection. And it's not because I just am a hoarder and that. It's because I collect these things as reference objects to inform me. And when I come into a problem, I just open up box the crates and move things around and sit there and meditate. And all of a sudden, the answer's right in front of me because I've got these, these catalysts for thought and imagination. But the first on the left is, is, is this, um, it's the T1. It's the world's first transistor radio. It's a, it came out of Chicago. It's the second device made with transistors. The first was an earbud. Um, they figured that's not exactly uh, the killer app for the transistor. And so the, the transistor industry, they, they, um, they sponsored the, the Regency was the company, uh, the people who manufactured this, and but uh, Painter Teague and Petersville were the industrial design firm. By the way, that Teague has no relationship to Walter Darwin Teague, um, and they built this device. And they are the ones who built, developed that form factor. You notice on the front of it, the dial is flush with the face. The industrial designers pay attention. The the, the front is flush. Um, the Grill is actually just a holes machined in a in a matrix on the on the on the on the main casing. Um, it the it's got a dial um, down the bottom half. Um, the the this, what's really interesting about that is that the remember the speaker grill is actually a display. It's an acoustic display. As a, that's what a speaker is. It's, it's, it is a display. It's a, it's acoustic display. Now, if you work down to the right, the second one is the, a, 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 a radio that Sony made. They were trying to make the first transistor radio. They couldn't. And, and when they founded the company, the whole idea was, we have to be first. We have to do something that never done before. And they were going to say, we're going to build the smallest radio ever. And, and of course, they didn't make it. Um, so what they did is they said, we're going to make the first radio that will fit in a man's shirt pocket. And, 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 and they actually didn't manage that. But at the trade show, what they did is they had custom shirts with slightly larger pockets so they weren't lying, right? But, but, that was, but, that, but they had to be first to, to be able to do that. But that's, I mean, I'm not making this up. This is, this is the world we live in. And this is, uh, tells you a little bit about marketing. Uh, talk to, listen to Terry O'Reilly uh, on CBC. Um, but that one also had uh, the grills, 
But they notice the material on the grill is metal, it's gold, it's glitzy, it's bling. Um, what's that, Zorowski or whatever, that, that jewelry line? That, um, it's kind of, what is it, how do you say? Zorowski or something. Um, but it's kind of like that. It's got red in there. It's got these different colors. It's uh, got this big dial that it's, it protrudes out and so on and so forth. But it, it's absolutely taken the grill idea from, from the, the first region, from the Regency. Now the next one, and these are all proper size, is, 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 the, is, 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 is the Braun radio that came out in 1958. Notice it has the flush rotary dial. Uh, this was done uh, by um, Dieter Rams at, at Braun and, and, and uh, the Hochschule in, uh, uh, in Ulm, that's right. Uh, and, and it's really minimal. Recognize that came out at the same time that uh, international uh, or Swiss design was coming out. Helvetica, the font, that's of the same design uh, aesthetic as Helvetica, and that's what was going on. And, and it's a completely different aesthetic of, of, the, uh, of, of the Sony. But it still has the same grill holes, it has the same proportions. Um, and then we come across to the iPod, and there's no question, it's, it, there's no dispute, and lots of people can tell you that that, that radio was the, the template for the, for the iPod. But what I'm trying to say, because I love this, is to say, yeah, we can all say that, that that's where Johnny, I've got, uh, that was the inspiration. But, but it realized it goes back another duration. That's why I go and see, it, it, because Dieter Rams was doing the same thing to the, to the Regency as, as, as Johnny was doing to, to Dieter Rams, and right? It's just shoulder on shoulder and shoulder. And then it bec when you have two, you have a line, but you have three, you start to get the surface and starts to, you have a more to sort of say, this is a continuous, it's a habit as opposed to just a, a fluke. And, and now you can sort of say, well, what's, how is it that those two radios, the, I, I should say one other thing about it that is actually really interesting. This is another view of the same radios. And I want to show you this one too, because remember I said it's all about prospecting? Whenever you see the, the iPod and the, and the Braun radio side by side, the Braun is always situated with the dial at the bottom. That's not how it's designed. The normal is this way, horizontal. And I want to say, these are, and all of these are photographs all taken at once. I haven't like, done the shots independently and composed them. And, and first of all, it's way bigger and it's designed this way. And when you see the difference in size, the similarity and, and the uh, sort of the genetic uh, continuity is much harder to see. And that's only a 90 degrees turn and a thing of scale. So even something where you just have the scale maybe 150% larger and it's a 90 degree twist, things are no, no what, what was obvious in the other shot aren't obvious anymore. And so that's easy to miss. And, there's, and this is the kind of thing that just, it's hidden in plain view. The minute you see it, you get it. But it's seen it first, that's the, the, the whole thing. And so this is what happens. If you go online and look up the, the Braun radio with the iPod, they're always shown that way to emphasize the similarities, which says, okay, well, of course he did that. When in fact, that's not how they were, and, and, the, and the creativity to actually see the relationship and actually see the possibilities, because when you see it that way, you say, oh, that's really neat. Um, the, the, the speaker is a display, it's an acoustic thing, so I'm going to put my, I'm going to have the same proportions basically of the, of the visual displays I had with the acoustic display. I'm going to keep things centered, and I'm going to keep things flush, and, and, and all those things to have this minimal, beautiful, clean design. And most industrial designers are seeing that, but most of them won't know about the, the Regency radio. But it makes, for me, it makes the story way more interesting. But it also makes it more interesting to say, well, why is the, why is the Braun bigger? And why is the other one bling? And here's, it's all about marketing. It's really quickly, the, the Sony is not for music. It's a lifestyle accessory. It was targeted to the North American market. It came out within the, the same years that, that Elvis Presley had um, his first hit records where um, Bill Haley in the comments had uh, 
Rock Around the Clock, which became uh, the, the, the key of rock and roll. It's when the first custom cars of California car culture started to become Big Daddy Roth, if you, Ed Big Daddy Roth was making custom cars and, and, and all this beach culture. It was a lifestyle accessory and the music didn't have to sound like cap. It was a high school kind of things. By the way, in Germany, there were no high schools. And, and there was no car culture because you had to be 18 to drive. And anyhow, it was right after the war and nobody had cars. Even your parents didn't have cars. They had motorcycles with sidecars if they had, or you came by bicycles. And, 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 and the whole thing, there was no teenage years. The teenager is an American construct that came out in the post-war years. And it didn't exist in Europe. I lived in Germany in 1958 when that radio came out. The, the, the buildings in Dortmund and these cities were still, hadn't been rebuilt from the war. And it was really austere. And the reason it's bigger is, yes, it's portable, because everybody listened to opera and classical music. They weren't listening to rock and roll. That was, that was sort of the music of the enemy. If they played, it was on the military, U.S. or the Canadian military uh, radio stations in Germany. So it's, 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 there's this whole social, cultural, political thing. The reason it's bigger is because it has a bigger speaker, which means it has better fidelity. And it was for listening to music. It was not a lifestyle thing to go along the beach like this and then to dance on your roller skates, which you had the, 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 the white ones, right? And, and so all of this stuff is coming to a completely different directions, but from the same route, from the Regency. But because of where they came, they went different directions. And, you, and then again, remember, it happened at the same time as Helvetica. And, and, and that whole school of design. And here's, you can see them together. And it's just, this, this is the stuff that really comes. And so just when I close, I have to say that it's really important to be a maker. But don't make until you know what's worth making or unless there's no, you've exhausted all possibilities. eBay, for me, is a far more useful prototyping tool than all the 3D printers in the world put together. Okay, I don't quite believe that. I'm exaggerating. Every once in a while I do that. But the point is this, that for, for I can go and get a wristwatch from, uh, I have a wristwatch, for example, from, from uh, 1984 that is a calculator wristwatch that has no buttons on it. It has a capacitive touchscreen, and the way you enter data is to go one plus two equals. You just write on the watch face. $99, I have four of them, and the battery lasts for one year. And that means if you can do that, you can do heads up writing. I can write down a phone number. And they had a calculator watch at the same time for $125 that you could look up phone numbers. And it would have eager recognition. So you could write, and I could get the first three letters of your nail and it would your name, and it would complete, and then give me the phone number. And if I was writing down your phone number, I could write it there without losing eye contact, or I could look in the book here to read, write it down while my eyes are looking at the, at the phone book, because they had phone books in those days. And all of those things could be applied on today's touchscreens, and none of them, nobody's done that yet. And, and the fact that I can't just be walking around and taking notes. And if you took graffiti from the Palm Pilot instead of the techniques they had, you could even write twice as fast. Just put the things together. It's all there. Buy a Palm Pilot from 19... 96, get one of those, those uh, phone, the, 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 it's $99, they're so going to cost you $1,000, but get, a, get one. Everything has a long nose. Everything is evolutionary. And, and as you come along, it's just, if you think about just standing on shoulders rather than invention, and look at relationships and how to mine them, and don't do it alone. And surround yourself with, with, uh, with things that just stimulate your invention. Don't be in an austere, horrible place. It doesn't mean you have to live in a mess. But, but, but those things, and change the stimulus. And, and, and basically, Jimi Hendrix is the greatest philosopher in, in experience design. He asked the most fundamental question, are you experienced? Right? An album cover. That was the name of the album. So the point is, if you do not have and cultivate and curate the breadth of your own personal experience, you're cheating yourself in your design because you have way less to draw upon to search for relationships and so on. And, and, that doesn't, and that's true for the individual, but it's also true for the team. So when you're putting a group together, make sure that you interview not just in terms of their skill sets, but what is the breadth of experience? 
I got to tell you, from building birch bark canoes or riding horses or, or bicycles or anything, all of those things feed into my design. Everything in my life and the, how I curate my own experiences, there's not a single thing I can think of that I haven't drawn on professionally. Not, and I didn't do it to know, if, have previewed what they were going to be valuable for. I just trusted, and you just go off, and sometimes you don't get it right. And I want to just finish now and sort of say one thing about these words. Innovation, evolution, and progress. It's really uh, important. And I didn't include invention here because I don't believe it exists. Um, there's insight. But the, the key thing is this. Um, MacIver wrote this in, in 1933. I think it's a really interesting thing, a just, uh, statement. He says, evolution is a scientific concept, and progress is an ethical one. And you can innovate in both directions, but, but evolution, whether it's just for money's sake or something like that, isn't enough in today. We've all worked really, really hard to get good at what we do. We can do, we're all here, you're here because you want to, hopefully, because you want to um, improve your skill set. Well, why? What are you going to apply it towards? And that's the most fundamental question. Because basically today, compared to certainly in the early days, we can do anything. And so the fundamental question is, now you can do anything, what should you do? And, and why? And, and then how do you prepare and, and, and build the skill set so that what we do actually is progress? And that sort of says, well, um, comes down to one of my heroes, which is, um, Melvin Kranzberg, who says, technology is not good, it's not bad, but nor is it neutral. It will be some combination of the two. As soon as you use the words good and bad, and you now say, if you believe that law, you know everything has good parts and bad parts. And that means to be able to distinguish that, what's your metric? What's your moral compass? Every decision you make technologically, even putting a paperclip into a new office, changes the culture of that office. It's an ethical decision for which none of us are trained to do, or few of us. I certainly wasn't. Um, but the other part is, the second law is that invention is the mother of necessity. That is to say that when you do it, you're going to get stuff wrong, but you own the responsibility to clean up your own mess without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which means you have to know the difference between a baby and a bathwater. But, and those are really hard problems. But if you look at what's going on today, if we can hone our chops and we can be really effective and stay mindful, if you want a problem, God, what, what better problem could we have and what better skill set do we have to try and bring influence to change the world and change the direction things are going, whether it's for climate change or, or feeding or further. It, it doesn't have to be this big sort of hippie thing. It's just whatever dimension that feeds you and inspires you to really go, then do it. But be mindful of, of why. And with that, I just say thank you, and uh, I hope this helps. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>